And I ask all the students, so who has a YouTube channel? Who's making content? I get this look of surprise and disrespect. Why should filmmakers care about YouTube? I mean, look at it. It's not exactly cinema. Ah! YouTube and film are seen as two completely separate entities, but maybe they're more similar than we actually realize. Young aspiring filmmakers have a blind spot. Yeah, I would hope these filmmakers take YouTube as an opportunity to create content. So should you upload your films amongst Mr. Beast videos? <laughs> But if you're working on YouTube's retention rules, does that mean that you can't make your movie the way you envisioned it? Could The Dark Knight work on YouTube? It just has to happen faster. But the platform could also be a place to learn how to be a masterful filmmaker. I've learned more about editing by making YouTube videos than working in the industry. To be honest, we don't know if YouTube is a good or bad place for filmmakers, but we wanted to explore these ideas with Sven Pop. He is edited for films that have been to Sundance and Cannes, but he's best known for his YouTube channel, This Guy Edits. Sven is the rare content creator who has a foot both in the YouTube world and the traditional film world. And so we wanted to ask him the question, why filmmakers have chosen to ignore YouTube until recently? I think they still do, to be honest. Like I'm still looking for that signal where YouTube gets that respect. Mm. Like I, I mean, I come from, from the, traditional film editing and TV editing. And I still feel like I'm one of a handful of people that are like traditional film editors that are respecting YouTube in a way. Every once in a while, I go back to film school as a guest lecturer and I ask all the students, so who has a YouTube channel? Who's like making content? I get this look of like surprise and like disrespect. Oh, really? In, in a way where I can sense that even young students look down on YouTube as a, a young filmmakers, as oh. a medium to connect with an audience or to build their craft. I think this is sort of the what we want to explore today is to figure out why are we at this point right now and it, whether it's going to stay that way or not. There was sort of this disdain for Netflix for quite a while with editors. I remember that. People were like, what? You, you're working on a Netflix show? That changed once Netflix made a strategic decision and said, we want to be respected. We're going to go for awards and we're going to enable filmmakers to make the films they want to make. And we're going to start off with David Fincher. Yeah. And they basically said... David Fincher, that project that you couldn't really get set up or it didn't really happen for you, you can do whatever you want. Here's the money that you need. Go go ahead and do it. And at least for me, that changed everything in terms of looking at Netflix as a different platform. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly the game was on and I think it, it that was the turning point for them. I think YouTube tried something very similar early on with like their... YouTube originals. Yeah, the originals. It didn't quite work because I think they were sort of pulling from their own as yeah. opposed to pulling somebody in from the outside. That's true. If that's something that they want, if they want to have this recognition as a platform, if they want to think about, okay, what are some ways how we can really compete if we even have to with Netflix or the networks or whatever, that might be what it's going to require for filmmakers in the audience to look at at the content differently. When something has that type of high production quality, it does remove the nature of the habit that we have on YouTube, where I think it is, I'm wanting something that kind of has that sort of uh, cheap feeling. Uh, and the best example would be, despite Mr. Beast spending up to a million dollars per video, there's a reason why they're still shooting it on Sony DSLRs. Mm -hmm. The moment it becomes that too high of production quality, the authenticity is lost. The believability is lost. I still think that as a filmmaker, especially if you're a young filmmaker, you shouldn't disregard YouTube as a platform for you to connect to an audience or at the very least work on your craft. Yeah. Because the best way to work on your craft is to get that feedback mm -hmm. from an outside audience. Definitely in my case, I think I wanted to be the filmmaker. YouTube just happened to be the place where I was like, hey, I made something fun. I posted on this website. Come check out this video. Come watch this video. And then I was getting that feedback in that sense. Now videos are getting a lot more organically discovered as well. I always did see that 
YouTube just being that simply that platform for me to share the short films I created, albeit yes, I was 14, 15, they were absolutely terrible, but I was having that experience and that feedback loop of constantly improving all the time. Some of the students who do have, why do you think they are still rejecting that opportunity? I think it's because they're consuming YouTube mm -hmm. just like everybody else and they're disregarding it as a filmmaking opportunity. Mm -hmm. And for, for some reason, there's a block in a way. They feel like, okay, there's a certain way how I will become a filmmaker, which is I write my scripts, I make my shorts, I get into some festivals, and then somebody will talk to me and say, hey, what do you want to do next? And then I'll give him my feature film script, mm -hmm. and then you go out and you make your film. That's sort of the traditional way of how independent filmmakers dream of becoming a filmmaker and have been for decades. There's some people that are taking YouTube as a medium to tell stories, narrative mm -hmm. stories, but nobody's cracked the code yet. I mean, I would hope we can inspire some of these filmmakers to really uh, take YouTube as an opportunity to create content, the stories they want to tell. Like being a content creator doesn't necessarily mean you have to pop out a video every week that is like fulfilling a certain need to have the audience come back and watch it, whatever that is. There's all kinds of content that works on on YouTube. But the, the, the narrative storytelling so right now, I don't see any shows where I feel like, oh, I want to subscribe to this. I want to find out what happens in the next episode. One of the biggest things is, yeah, is the commitment thing where it's. Let's just say you go to the theater, you've chosen to see this movie. You've already dedicated that time to see this movie. You pay for the ticket, you sit down, you watch the 30 minutes of ads. This is you settling in and then the movie starts. That's your committed, that you're yeah. committed towards watching this movie for the next hour and a half, two, three hours. Whereas of YouTube, the commitment level is significantly lower because you click on this video, you're instantly advertised 20 other videos that you can watch instead. And if this video isn't delivering on that promise straight away, well, I go, well, that's it, I'm out. I'm gonna click on one of these ones instead. That means we need to find more instances and better storytelling methods to say, hey, this is the video that you should watch. Yeah. And so it has become a really, really great way for me as a filmmaker to learn, how can I give you good reasons to stay? How can I give you good reasons to be watching the, the entirety of my video, knowing that you can leave at any moment? Yeah, in traditional filmmaking, we call that the dramatic question, which is like, mm -hmm. will something happen? You got to ask a question early on, mm -hmm. and then you got to make sure that that question actually matters to the audience. Yeah. So finding the right question and then teasing it, teasing it, teasing it, and delivering on the answer towards somewhere at the end is, I think, one strategy to tell a really interesting story, and it could still be. I'm interested to hear your story about how you decided to start YouTube and what that journey was like from your very first video that you posted to where you are now. It started with my daughter, who was in elementary, and she did like little YouTube videos on My Little Ponies. So she was doing the little figurines and filming that and telling stories. And I just quickly realized that she was growing an audience. She was making money. I'm like, what? You, <laughs> you, you can buy your own camera. You can buy your own lights. And I realized that this medium has to be taken seriously. So I started experimenting with a YouTube channel about gardening. And I had backyards chickens. And I posted one video, the first video I filmed it with my phone. I had a good topic. It was about like worms and chickens. And <laughs> so there was some drama there. And, <laughs> but it took only like 10 minutes to film it and yeah. narrate it. I didn't really cut it. And I made 200 bucks. For me, this was the moment where I realized you have to take this medium seriously. You can uh, tell stories that you're interested in. It can be about anything. And if you tell the stories the right way, YouTube will find a way to give you an audience. I realized there's a pattern there and I just need to figure out what that pattern is. And then I could probably have repeatable success. And then I pitched this idea to my director who I was cutting a feature for right now and said, look, this is an independent film. We've done this two times before. We went to Sundance mm -hmm. and we got the movie in a theater and nobody showed up. This doesn't have to be that way. What if we already document the process? I'll just open up the editing bay and make episodes about the editing process. I thought it was going to be like PewDiePie when he did the Let's Play. Yeah. Kind of people would be into that as well. And he was like, okay, let's do that. And it started building a little momentum. It was a few thousand views, a couple of blocks picked it up. 
Um, and then I realized, okay, I need to change it up. The, the fact that I'm just editing and showing it is not enough to really keep the audience interested. Mm -hmm. So then I, it became more about, okay, what can you learn about film editing? How can you shape a scene dramatically and, and share that with, with other people? And at that moment, then it started to really grow. And then I took it to another level once the movie was done where I'm like, now how can I apply this that it's more universal, like doing a, an editing analysis of a Christopher Nolan movie and just taking a scene apart. And that's when it really then sort of transformed into a business in a way where you could have sponsors and, and a bigger audience, bigger views. Throughout this whole process, I'm like, I'm having the most fun I've ever had. Having this relationship with an audience that keeps on growing, I would say, just try it and don't worry about it. Like, just focus on the things that keep you excited, make them. And then in whatever form or way you have to communicate that to the audience is what you'll have to do. And they'll they'll appreciate it. I think that's the bottom line. You just have to go for it. If you're th out there and you're like, I want to be a filmmaker, I want to be an editor. Like, how can I do that? What do I need to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Literally, you just go for it. Hello, cheeky segue. In traditional media, the crew gets residuals for the work that they produce. And for a long time, YouTube didn't have that option. Until now. Stir lets creators split their AdSense with their team. If you're an editor, producer, writer, or thumbnail artist, Stir can allow you to take your cut of the project's AdSense automatically. That means you don't have to do the maths, it does it for you. Which is bloody great because I'm really crap at maths. Stir's credit feature also lets crew members get credited for their work. Simply paste the video into Stir, request a credit, and once approved, it appears on your profile. This is web media's version of IMDB, so don't miss out on this opportunity to get credit for your work. YouTube opens with the meta of like, today I'm doing this, or I'm gonna be doing this, kind of is going with that delivering the promise idea straight away. I like that philosophy because you see the title and thumbnail, you go, okay, I wanna know more about this. You click on it, you get the reaffirmation that you've made the right choice. Mm -hmm. Opening up on a movie is a very different philosophy. But I also wanna kind of play that game, whereas if a movie was to be watched on YouTube, how else would that movie open? One of my favorite opening sequences of all time is The Dark Knight. It's a very slow opening. It, it comes in with the clouds and it shows the bat symbol and it comes in with that helicopter shot going very, very, very closely towards that building. For me, that's a really, really effective opening because we're hearing the music, we're hearing Hans Zimmer's guitar strings coming in. That's giving that sense of anticipation. And then it's signed a frame on one window and I think something's gonna happen with that window. And then this one goes and that throws me off and that makes me so satisfied. Right, that's it, I'm in. I would love for that to happen on YouTube in terms of like, how can we even open up a video in that sense of like, here's some questions raising, here's how it's gonna feel. And then you deliver on the promise in that sense. Could the Dark Knight work on YouTube? It just has to happen faster. How long do you think that moment was? That was like 25 seconds, I think. 25 like. seconds, so yeah. you gotta accomplish that in four seconds. Yeah. And then you can do it. Actually, my experience has been on this, Tesla Solar channel, I do like wide opening shots. Mm -hmm. I play music, I do some like B-roll before I start talking. So there's a good amount of time mm -hmm. before I get into the topic where I just let the people experience the world and yeah. it seemed to work. What does the retention look like on that? I mean, it's long enough for the algorithm to get tr triggered. But yeah. it, like my retention rates are never what <laughs> what you show in your videos. It's never <laughs> eighty yeah. percent. The algorithm likes it. So yeah, so it's 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 not always about trying to get that eighty percent retention. It pushes the video out a lot more. Mm -hmm. But what it also means is that twenty percent has gone. Okay, let me look into that twenty percent. Here's all the commonalities. Let me find other users with the same commonalities. Let me send it to them and therefore they will like it as well. You're giving the algorithm so much more to f actually more coherent data to work with actually. Mm. So uh, getting a 25% retention on let's just say a 50 minute video, that's actually fantastic. My go-to opening is uh, sort of a traditional cold open where mm. I just tease the episode. This is what it's about. This is the problem. This is why you should care. Let's go. Sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> like in the last video, completely didn't work. How do you think you can make a cold open work on YouTube? First, I got to hook them in. Yeah. I got to find something. It's, it can be production, it can be spectacle, it can be a really interesting question, a really, like a, a really intense moment in the video that I'm just going to front load. That 20 seconds then I use to ask the dramatic question and 
tell them what the stakes are, what's in it for them. Why should they care about this question and figure out what the answer is? Once I've accomplished that, then I basically just say, let's go. And then I start telling a story. For me, in my videos, I think the thing that's lacking out of those, that formula that you just laid out is the why they should care yeah. part. And it's hard to yeah. tell you, hey, you should really care about this music video. I don't know why you should care, but I think that why you should care is the key thing that a lot of people need to hear. What's like your favorite opening movie or favorite opening style of all time? And how do you think you can make that work on YouTube? I don't think it will work on YouTube. Oh, really? Just period. But the way that I really love to open my own videos is usually with sound and a black screen. And sometimes we'll put up like some credits or have like a quote. It's just a really artsy way to open <laughs> up a video. But it's kind of like the the way that Nope opened. It is exactly, it's like, that's yeah. honestly my favorite way to open stuff because it's just so mysterious. And for me as a viewer, when I see that, it just really draws me in. In order to create that opening, there has to be that trust. And I yeah. don't think that trust exists on YouTube. I think subscribers will be interested. Yep. But if you're a new viewer, why and should you're starting you off with a mystery, why the hell would I care? Exactly. And so I click off. Yeah. You're trying to give me a mystery. I don't care. I'm eating my lunch. Next. Yep. yep. Jordan, how long have you been in the music industry or cutting music videos? How many? So years? I started in 2019. 2019. Okay. So obviously at that point music videos on youtube was huge already Absolutely. i mean it's been 10 years or however long it was i wonder what your take is on why music videos work on youtube and like a short or a feature film might not is there something that they're doing or is it because it's just short I mean, there's a lot of a lot of reasons and definitely because it's short but i mean if you look at the history of music videos they really started on mtv and so there's literally a channel that you had to flip to to just watch music videos over and over and over, one after another. It was, was, was a great time. It was a great time. time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think once MTV died and that, that you know, sort of passed away, they needed to fill that void with something. Mm -hmm. And YouTube is just the easiest platform. It's honestly like its own streaming service. It's almost like, like its own Spotify, its own mm -hmm. Apple Music. I'm still pretty young, so I would love to hear what your guys is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, music video experience was, but I first watched music videos on iTunes. So yeah. I would literally have to buy the music video mm -hmm. on iTunes. And I remember watching like a Miley Cyrus music video. Mm -hmm. And and then once YouTube started taking off, that platform really took over. The thing that MTV became very quickly was it was a community and a movement. It was the opportunity to listen to music and you can just let it run. But they started building on that very quickly with the, like Total Request Live and all these shows where they would then be able to like meet the musicians and talk to them. And so I'm wondering if that part now is not as important anymore or is there another place where people can really have this community feel? Reddit and Twitter. Taylor Swift has released a music video and there was full of Easter eggs, full of little nods to all of her previous work. And then the community comes along on Reddit or maybe even in the YouTube comments. And that's where they have a discussion about the music video. Having even celebrities on TikTok. TikTok is changing it. TikTok is changing it. Some of the new musicians that are coming out of the woodworks are starting on TikTok because here's me documenting me making my album. Here's me documenting how I managed to make this song work. Artists tell stories really well on TikTok, actually, because yeah. the making of an album or what my song means or look, I'm writing a song right now and this is what I'm thinking. I was talking to this guy and he hurt my feelings. And so now I'm writing about this and people get so invested in those stories on TikTok. And I think that's maybe something that filmmakers can take inspiration from. It's mm -hmm. like part of social media is documenting the process. So even though I might make a video on YouTube and that's the final product, I'm documenting it on Instagram. I'm showing the timeline and I'm maybe I'm posting something on TikTok like, hey, I'm just in this scene right now and it's not working out. Uh, what's missing here? I'm just going to show it to you and you, you let me know. Give me give me that inspiration. These are all opportunities where you don't have to like create something new. You're just documenting the, the process of creation and make it part of the experience. And filmmakers that are shooting films could totally do that. It's the marketing campaign. You make your film, but then you post it on YouTube and no one watches it, or, or you post it and it goes through, through a couple film festivals. Okay, like that's still really, really great. However, though, if you're able to do the marketing campaign, create the hype, here's the struggles I made through the film. Documenting that process and then that, that gets me hyped. That gets me excited for the film. Uh, an example of that would be Yes Fury's Project Iceman documentary. They have made multiple videos of them. Here's how we're making this film. Here's where it started. Here's the process. 
And now we're then creating the hype, this urgency for me to want to see this film. They are hosting film festivals, but using social media to market it. The tickets are scarce. Like they've made them very limited tickets. I didn't get a ticket. And now I want to see this film. A massive streaming service offered them over a million dollars to buy this film, but suggested changes. And yes, Fury went, no. Dang. Because Are you serious? I'm not kidding. I'm, no, I didn't I'm know not that. kidding. But, and therefore, in my perspective, your reaction says it all. That's a great story. Doesn't that make you want to see the movie? Yeah, now? absolutely. So that's what I mean in terms of like, it's a great opportunity for you to even market your movie as well. And like, you're in charge of the marketing. What's been the biggest lesson for you that you think only YouTube could have taught you? It's the audience. I mean, I'm drawn to the audience anyway. That's why I'm a filmmaker. When I was a kid, I went to the movies and I felt these emotions. I wanted to be part of creating these emotions. And with YouTube, I get to live it. Even like working as an editor on a movie is really cool. You don't have the same direct mm -hmm. feedback. You don't get the same dopamine. You know a video is really popping and you feel like oh what i wanted it to do it's doing it i'm seeing it in the comments i'm seeing it that people are sharing it now all my storytelling all my writing is more geared towards okay now i kind of understand what people are looking for what they're responding to how can i apply that to uh, any any type of um, storytelling outside of youtube despite me also being doing big pushing backs against retention graphs and things like that and how that can uh, potentially diminish or be misinterpreting understanding your audience all that data really, really is is screen tests here's some content i made here's a film that i've made i've given it out to a thousand people and in this case it can be a million people and then you get that feedback you get that data of what did they like what did they replay what worked what didn't and i think that's probably one of the best ways a lot of creators have learned to be really really great filmmakers and especially for filmmakers how they could then learn their craft by then posting their films or posting what it is that they want to be doing. Look at those retention graphs. That's your screen test. And now you get to figure out how you can be a better filmmaker with that data. Actually, Netflix does the same thing. They're looking yeah. at the same data. Yeah. They're not necessarily sharing it with their uh, filmmakers, but it's out there and they know exactly. Oh, what the audience is doing. That could be incredibly dangerous. If Netflix did share that data, there's a reason why uh, Hollywood switched to streaming because they can finally get that data that YouTube's had for years. Yeah. That's true. If a filmmaker did want to be, let's just say, working for Fincher, working for James Cameron, working for Quentin, Nolan, why do they still think then that YouTube is a bad place to build on that CV? That's a blind spot. I'm just going to give you an example. I, I worked for James Cameron for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I saw him respond to a little animated short that he found on the internet of a guy who was doing a driving a rover on Mars just for fun. He had that on, he put that, and for some reason it was on Ada Cool News or something. So James Cameron saw that and he showed it to his lead graphics of effects artist and said, call that kid. I want that kid to be working for us. So he used Reddit or however it, the word got out um, to create proof of concept. Mm -hmm. And proof of concept is so important in the business. Like David Fincher is not going to hire you because you graduated from film school. David Fincher is going to consider you being part of his crew as an intern because you made an interesting short or something else. Mm -hmm. And that something else can be the chance that it's going to get his attention is when it's authentic and unique. That's even more important than that it's actually good. It has yeah. to be authentic and unique. Wow. And so I think that's the potential of YouTube. And I think potentially young aspiring filmmakers have a blind spot. They don't realize it. Even though I've learned more about camera and lighting <laughs> and editing yeah. by making YouTube videos than having done several features and been working in the industry for, for many, many years. And the reason why that is, is the repetition. There's always this little thing that you're like learning with every new video where like, mm -hmm. oh, the lighting this time works, looks even better than before. Or now I've started to understand why I need to change th things. Mm -hmm. And you, with any film, you never really have the opportunity. You always only know how to make that film when you're done making the film. Yeah. And then you can't really apply it to your next film 100%. It's like it just becomes like another concept that maybe you will apply down the road somehow in another way. Mm -hmm. And with YouTube, 
you can immediately um, innovate. The first video I saw of yours was the Dunkirk breakdown. It blew my mind. And I just want to say as a as a little fan right here, you're such an inspiration to us, you know, philosophical YouTube editors. So thank you so much for your uh, Yeah, well, your thank you. <laughs> I, have, I love that you like that video. The, the crazy thing is I made that video in a week. Wow. Like I'm at a point now where I couldn't even make this video because I'm so like trying to step it up mm. that it's hard to just make a video in a week. And I need to find ways to get back to just popping out content, yeah. not worrying about it. Sometimes we hate it when the less is more videos become the best ones. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess, yeah, we're trying to recreate it. Actually, I think that's a good experience. The bad experience is I spent probably six months doing the Interstellar video. Six, Wait a second. Wait, six months? That's actually the first video I saw now yeah. that I think about it. Yeah. Because it's just, I had to like go through all the edits. I had to record all my analysis on it. And then that's crazy. Six wow. months. And then it popped. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so this is what I have to do now. Yeah. Is, and then I did it again for another one and it didn't work. For me, though, my favorite video of yours was the uh, Breaking Down Comedy. For me, that's been a really, really challenging experience for a lot of creators to understand comedy and especially comedy and editing. Yeah. And so I think is I, I have those experiences where it's like they want to throw every single joke in. Yeah. And I even have the experiences of a logo and it's like, hey, you've done this joke, this joke, this joke and this joke but I'm only gonna go with this joke and all these other ones are gonna go. Yeah. And he hates that. That's been a massive rule that I think a lot of creators struggle with. They focus on the punchline and they wanna get to that punchline as quickly as possible. Yeah. I might be get a little, but I want the laugh. And, <laughs> yeah. so, and so a lot of it does come towards the setup, but that means time. I'm so happy that that video is doing well mm -hmm. because that would be my perfect type of content I'd love to continue doing forever. Yeah. Because this is like, Roger Nagat is an Emmy nominated editor on Veep or Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. So he knows a lot more about comedy editing than probably 99% of filmmakers out there. Absolutely. And to give him the opportunity to talk about it in a format where it's actually entertaining. Yeah. And then it has this massive appeal, not just like an interview on YouTube where like 3000 people watch it, is is for me that's the, that's a great opportunity we'll keep doing it because you're blowing our socks off and yeah we're, we're enjoying it so much so. yeah you've allowed us to fanboy so thank you